In this episode, I'll discuss random variables whose values follow a normal distribution. These are called, not surprisingly, normal random variables. But before we get to them, we'll need to do some preliminary work, mainly introducing terminology and discussing some simple computations associated with that terminology. First and foremost, a data point's standard score is the number of standard deviations it lies above the mean. Some examples will make this idea clear. Here's one to start with. Among Minitrue's employees, the mean work week is 35 hours and the standard deviation is 6 hours. So, what's the standard score for a 47 hour work week? Well, the standard score of this data point, 47 hours, is, by definition, the number of standard deviations it lies above the mean. So let's think this through. 47 is 12 hours above the mean, and each standard deviation is 6 hours. 12 divided by 6 is 2, so 47 is 2 standard deviations above the mean. That is, 47 standard score is 2. Simple enough, but it's worth going through this again from a distance to capture the computational essence of standardizing. We started with a raw score of 47, then we subtracted off the mean, then we had to see how many times our standard deviation went into this surplus, so we divided by the standard deviation. The result was our standard score. And this process will always work. To get any data point standard score, we start with its raw score, subtract off the mean, and divide by the standard deviation. Easy. Let's take another example. What's the standard score for a 40 hour work week? Well, we start with our raw score of 40, subtract off the mean of 35, and then divide the result by the standard deviation of 6 to find that the standard score here is 5 sixths. That is, someone who works 40 hours a week at Minitrue works 5 sixths of a standard deviation above the mean. One last one. What's the standard score for a 27 hour work week? Well, someone who works 27 hours works less than the mean number of hours, so we should expect this standard score to be negative. Let's see. The raw score of 27 minus the mean of 35 does indeed give us a negative number, and when we divide by the standard deviation of 6, we get negative 1 and a third. That is, the standard score corresponding to a 27 hour work week is about negative 1.33 one and a third standard deviations below the mean. Now let's turn this sort of question on its head. What work week has a standard score of 0.3? Well, to have a standard score of 0.3 is to be 0.3 standard deviations above the mean. So we start at the mean, which is 35 hours, and add on 0.3 of a standard deviation, which is 6 hours. This brings us to our answer. 36.8 hours. Naturally, the same sort of computation will work for negative standard scores. For example, what work week has a standard score of minus 1.62? Well, to have a standard score of minus 1.62 is to be 1.62 standard deviations below the mean. So we start at the mean, subtract off 1.62 standard deviations, that is 1.62 copies of 6, and by doing the arithmetic, we discover that a 25.28 hour work week has the standard score in question. Good. Let's turn to another sort of question. Suppose that apples have a mean weight of 9 ounces, and that oranges have a mean weight of 11 ounces. Suppose further that you have a 12 ounce apple and a 12 ounce orange. Of these two fruits, which one is more unusual? Let's start with one possible analysis. The orange is slightly overweight one ounce over the mean orange, but the apple is very overweight, three ounces over the mean apple. Thus, the apple is more unusual. How does that analysis sound to you? Not too convincing, I hope, because it is a bad analysis. The numbers involved are all correct, but if we are to decide whether something is unusual, we must first know how much variation we can usually expect. To answer this question sensibly, we need to know the standard deviations involved. So let's add this information to our box. We'll suppose that apples have a standard deviation of 3 ounces, and that oranges have a standard deviation of half an ounce. Now let's do a proper analysis. Yes, the apple is 3 ounces above the mean, but since the standard deviation for apples is 3 ounces, 
the apple is just one standard deviation above the mean weight for apples. On the other hand, the orange is only one ounce above the mean, but the standard deviation for oranges is just half an ounce. So the orange is two standard deviations above the mean orange weight. Thus, the orange is more unusual. So even though they say you can't compare apples and oranges, you actually can with standard scores. That's enough about fruit. Suppose you take an exam with a thousand possible points. Your score is a 460. How well did you do? Here's one possible answer. Very poorly. Everyone knows that 46% is an F, right? Wrong. We know nothing whatsoever about the distribution of scores on this exam, so we can't say anything yet about how well you did. 460 might be the best score anyone has ever received on this exam. Or it might be the worst. Or it could be anything in between. Well, suppose we add a little information. Your standard score is a 1. Now we can say something. You did quite well. A full standard deviation above the mean. That's a very good start. Can we say anything more specific, though? Not really. Not without knowing more about the distribution of the scores. But let's suppose we do know something in this line. Suppose we know also that the scores are normally distributed. This is better. We know that the bell is centered at the mean, whatever that might be, and that your score was one standard deviation above it. Now we can recall our old friend, the normal rule, which tells us that within one standard deviation of the mean, we'll get about 68% of the data. The remaining 32% lie in the tails of the bell, split evenly between them, 16% for each tail. Thus, your score on the test separates the top 16% from the rest of the pack, the remaining 84%. So now we can be quite specific. Your score is better than 84% of all the scores. That is, your score is at the 84th percentile of all scores. You've probably encountered this idea of a percentile before, but in case you haven't, its meaning is nothing more than what we've just described. To take another example, if a 10-year-old girl's height is at the 55th percentile for girls her age, it just means that she's taller than 55% of her peers. Very simple idea. One more bit of terminology. Standard scores of normal random variables have a special name. They're called z-scores. I'll do another example like the last one, but using this terminology. Suppose you take an exam. The scores are normally distributed. Your z-score is 2. How well did you do? Very well. Two standard deviations above the mean. And because the data is normally distributed, we can say more. The normal rule tells us that approximately 95% of the data lies within two standard deviations of the mean, which leaves only 2.5% for each tail. Thus, your score separates the top 2.5% from the rest. You did better than 97.5% of those who took the test. Hence, your score is slightly above the 97th percentile, a very good place to be. So much for new terminology. Let's consider a few different normal random variables. First, let x be the height in inches of a randomly chosen American man. x is indeed normal, with a mean of 70 inches, that's 5 foot 10, and a standard deviation of 3 inches. Thus, if we wanted to put our values of x along the bottom of the bell, we'd have 70 at the center, while the standard deviation of 3 sets the scale. But if, instead of measuring in inches, in our raw units, we wanted to use standard scores, which, since x is normal, we'd call z-scores, then we'd have a different alternative set of values beneath the bell. The center, 70 inches, is the mean, so its z-score is 0. 73 inches is one standard deviation above the mean, so its z-score is 1. 67 inches is one standard deviation below the mean, so its z-score is minus 1. Similarly, we get z-scores of plus and minus 2 and plus and minus 3 in the expected places. Let's put up another normal random variable. Let y be the IQ score of a randomly chosen person. IQ scores are indeed normally distributed, with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15 points. Thus, the y scores on the bell are centered at 100, and the standard deviation of 15 determines the scale. If, however, we are interested not in the raw y scores, but the standardized z scores, then we'd have an alternative set of labels beneath our bell. And we'll look at one more normal random variable. 
let m be the weight of a randomly chosen Martian, in Martian pounds, of course. These weights are normally distributed, and as you probably know, the mean Martian weight is 42 pounds, with a standard deviation of 7 pounds. Once again, our labels beneath the bell could be expressed in terms of the raw M scores or the corresponding standard scores, the Z scores. Now let's take a step back and look at all three of our normal random variables. Let's erase the raw scores and promote the Z scores to the top line. Now, with the surface details stripped away, our three bells are indistinguishable, which tells us something important. Different normal random variables are identical beneath the skin. Their common skeleton looks like this, and it's called, not surprisingly, the Z distribution. This Z distribution, which some people also call the standard normal distribution, underlies every normal distribution. It's important to us because we can transform questions about any normal random variable into questions about its Z distribution skeleton. And thus, if we understand the Z distribution, we understand all normal distributions. Let's see how by looking at an example. Go back to one of the random variables we've just mentioned. Let x be the height of a randomly chosen American man. This is a normal random variable with a mean of 70 inches and a standard deviation of 3 inches. Now for a question. What's the probability that a randomly chosen American man is under 6 feet tall? Or in symbols, what's the probability that x is less than 72? This probability corresponds to the shaded area under the graph. We'll be able to find it if we can turn this into a question about the Z skeleton underneath. In particular, we can translate our question about X into one about Z. The probability that X is less than 72 is the probability that Z is less than whatever the Z score is for 72. To find that Z score, we just standardize 72. Subtract off the mean, 70 inches, and divide by the standard deviation of 3 inches. When we do that, we find that the probability of a man under 6 feet tall is the probability that z is less than 2 thirds. Okay, but what is that probability? The normal rule isn't much help here, since it says nothing about the percentage of data within 2 thirds of a standard deviation of the mean. So what are we going to do? In the old days, we would have consulted a z table from which we could have extracted an answer to our question. Today, however, we use a computer. And in this class, we'll use the website Wolfram Alpha. Just type Wolfram Alpha into your favorite search engine and you will find it. To use Wolfram Alpha to find the probability we want, we just type probability that z is less than two-thirds into the bar. After you press enter, you may need to scroll down a bit, but you'll see something like this on your screen. This is the result we want. Don't worry about the expression on the left-hand side. We just want the decimal approximation on the right. Two decimal places will suffice for our purposes, so I'll go back to our solution and write that the probability that z is less than two-thirds is approximately 0.75. If we pick a random American man, there's about a 75% chance that he'll be under six feet tall. Let's do another example. What's the probability that a randomly chosen person's IQ is between 88 and 112? This concerns a normal random variable that we mentioned earlier, and we can easily express the probability that we want in terms of it. Namely, we want the probability that y is between 88 and 112. Since y is normal, we can turn this into a question about z, the skeleton that underlies all normal random variables. To translate from y to z, we standardize 88, and we standardize 112. After some arithmetic, we find that this becomes the probability that z is between minus 0.8 and positive 0.8. And this is precisely the sort of thing we can type into Wolfram Alpha. When we do so and hit enter, we find that the probability we seek is about 0.58. Hence, about 58% of people have IQs between 88 and 112. Okay, we'd better look at a question about those Martian weights. I'm sure you know that Martian society is based on a hierarchy of weight. The heavier the Martian, the more social status he has. With that in mind, we'd like to know how much must a Martian weigh to be in the heaviest 1% of all Martians? That is, we're looking for the weight that will separate the top 1% from the remaining 99%. It looks like this weight should be somewhere between 56 and 63 pounds. But what is it? Whatever it is, we know it's at the 99th percentile of our distribution. 
Simply typing 99th percentile into Wolfram Alpha will help us. Pressing Enter, and perhaps scrolling down a bit, it gives the result we need. The 99th percentile has a z-score of 2.33. What this tells us is that in any normal distribution, the 99th percentile occurs 2.33 standard deviations above the mean. So, in this case, the 99th percentile must be 42, which is the mean, plus 2.33 standard deviations, that is 2.33 sevenths. Add that up, and you get 58.31 Martian pounds. A Martian who weighs at least that much is in the top 1%. Good. When you ask Wolfram Alpha, or a z-table for that matter, a question about the z-distribution, you might wonder where the answer actually comes from. Here is the idea in brief. Probabilities, such as the one we asked for, correspond to areas under the z-curve. That z-curve is the graph of a particular mathematical function, and if you've studied a little calculus, you should recognize that we can find that area by integrating the function over the appropriate interval. If you haven't had calculus, don't worry, you do not need it for this course. You also do not have to know the formula for the z-score I've just put on the screen. There are a couple of things I want to mention about that formula, though. First, note that it involves, of all things, pi. Now pi is connected to circles, so what on earth does it have to do with the normal distribution? I'm going to have to just leave that as an unanswered question to tantalize the mathematically inclined. And the other thing I want to mention about this formula. At the very beginning of this episode, some old German currency was on the screen. A 10 Deutschmark note featuring Carl Friedrich Gauss, one of the greatest mathematicians who ever lived. If you look closely, you'll see a bell curve in the background. The normal distribution is sometimes called the Gaussian distribution in Gauss's honor, since he did some early important work discovering some of its properties. If you zoom in closely on that Bill's bell, you can see something very close to the formula for the z distribution. The bill shows a slightly more general version of the formula, but if you set mu equals zero and sigma equals one on the bill's formula, you get the formula that I wrote down for the z distribution. And that is all for this video. See you next time.